Today, uh, we're delighted to have uh, Emma Zhang, uh, who's a uh, brand new assistant professor in the Management Sciences Department over at uh, the Gables campus. Um, as you guys know, Yong Tao Guan is, is the chair of the department, who's also across the secondary point with us here in biostatistics. So Emma just got her PhD uh, this year from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana in the Statistics Department. And um, before that, she got a, 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 you have another PhD? No. No, okay, it's <laughs> a degree from uh, Nankai University in, in China in mathematics. Um, so she's got a, um, a variety of <clears throat> interesting research interests. Uh, we'll hear about some of the stuff today in network modeling and inference. Uh, clearly, statistical computing, Monte Carlo theory and methodology, some Bayes analysis, non-parametric statistics, and some machine learning. And when I look through her um, places where she's kind of published in, areas that she's published in, there's some really interesting things about you know, statistical models for network resilience that are resilient to targeted attacks, um, Monte Carlo algorithms that you're seeing today, and then a nice JASA paper on conditional inference for for network data as well. So this whole area of network analysis is clearly a, a, a very nice niche that she's carving out. So we're glad to have you here. Welcome, and, and we'll look forward to talking. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to get an invitation and be able to present my research here. And it's really nice getting to know everyone in the Bellstead division. Um, as um, Raul introduced, uh, my main research interest is in network analysis, statistic computing, and um, also in general, just Monte Carlo methodology and theory. Um, the topic that I picked to present on today is more applied, so it's more interesting to talk about, it's less theoretical. And this is joint work with my PhD advisor, Hugo Chen at UIUC. Um, the topic I choose is Monte Carlo algorithms for identifying densely connected subgraphs. Uh, this is just a quick outline of what, what, what will I cover um, in the talk today. So the title is Monte Carlo algorithms for identifying densely connected subgraphs. Before we get started, we first have to figure out what do I mean by densely connected subgraphs? So here are some very interesting examples in real world networks. For example, in the biological systems, a lot of times you can establish network based on the protein-protein interaction or protein-DNA interaction. So in those networks, a densely connected subgraph are usually a group of protein or DNA that work together in certain biological functions. And in social networks, a densely connected subgraph are usually a group of individuals or organizations that share common interests or demographic information. And in the World Web, uh, World Wide Web Network, um, a densely connected subgraph is a group of web pages that deal with the similar or same topics. So why it is interesting to study such dense subgraphs in networks? The first reason is um, due to the nature of the dense connection in a subgraph, the members within such uh, subgraphs have more direct, more frequent, and stronger contact with, with each other. And studying the architecture of such dense subgraphs are very useful to us because it can first help us understand the network better. Second, they carry a lot of information within those dense subgraphs. For example, if we can find what are some really dense connected subgraphs within the social networks, we can target them as potential consumer groups. Or in the biological systems, if we can find densely connected protein cliques or protein clusters, then we can study what do they, what do they work together um, to produce? What is the biological function they are uh, participating in? So um, hopefully this justified why this is an interesting problem. And this uh, identifying densely connected subgraphs is not a very trivial problem because intuitively, if you want to find a dense subgraph, you can just plot it out and you just visually identify where are the dense regions. But as you can see, this is a moderately sized um, network. It has about 5,000 nodes. It's a protein-protein interaction network in East. So each node here represents a protein. And if two proteins interact with each other, then we have an edge between those two. And this is a relatively sparse graph, but you can see if you try to plot it out, everything just clumped together, and there's no way you can tell uh, where are the dense areas, where are the sparse areas. So this also gives us um, 
some guidance like why do we want to have a more refined algorithm to do this because naive approach may not work. So the next step, um, next step in this project is to um, formally identify what are densely connected subgraphs because you have intuitions but how do you formulate it in a mathematical problem. Um, before I formally define what are densely connected subgraphs, I have to talk about what is the densest graphs. So densest graphs is inarguably cliques. So in a clique, there is an edge between every pair of individuals. For example, this is a um, size 10 clique. It's a, a network that have 10 individuals. Imagine this is like a friendship network. So we have 10 people in this network and everyone is friends with everyone else. So it's a fully connected graph. And then this graph is the densest because there is not one edge that's missing from this graph and everyone is fully connected with the rest of the network. So this is the densest graph. And to define densely connected subgraphs is our relaxation of the definition of cliques in different ways. For example, you can relax um, the definition of edge density. So edge density is defined as 2 times the total number of edges divided by n uh, times n minus 1. So here, n is the total number of nodes. You can also see this as um, m divided by um, 2 out of n. So this is how many edges there could be because you have n nodes. You just randomly establish edges between n pair of nodes. So this is a total possibility and this is how many you observe and this quantifies how dense the edges are in the graph. As you can see in the, uh, in the previous example, the edge density is 1. So in general, the higher the edge density is, the more dense the graph is connected. We can also relax the definition of clicks through the average degree, which is the total number of edges divided by the total number of nodes. And we can also relax the definition through degree sequence. For example, um, in this graph, the degree sequence is a vector um, with 10 elements, and for ele every element is 9. So a degree sequence is pretty much saying how many friends each individual have. So for a clique, uh, in this size 10 clique, everyone have nine friends. But in general, for example, if we have a friendship network of 10 individuals and everyone have at least seven friends, then we can see this network is pretty dense. So it's relax the definition of clique in different ways can give us different objective functions in terms of defining what do we mean by dense subgraphs. So next step is to formulate a mathematical problem and um, a lot of statistical problem essentially boils down to an optimization problem. So this um, is also a p follows that path. So what do we want to do is that we want to find a network that maximizes certain objective functions. The definition for the objective function um, is up to a researcher. You can define it as edge density, average degree, or minimum uh, degree sequence. So here, the, op uh, the algorithms that we define or, or we develop in this work is not restricted to the objective function we use. But here we just always go what is the most commonly used in the literature um, as a demonstration. So in this case, the first question we're interested in is how do we find the densest subgraphs with a fixed size k? So if we know what is the densest subgraph size and we want to just find the densest one, how do we formulate that problem? So the objective function is q of the subgraph ck and the state space is k connect, uh, is a connected subgraph of size k um, of the given graph G. So if you consider a graph G, it has all kinds of, um, so you, if you have a graph with n nodes, and if you're looking at a subgraph with size k, there are this many possibilities in total. But here, we're zooming in on only the connected subgraphs. The reason why we do that is because the nature of the analysis is that we want to study the interaction of the nodes in the network. And 
if the network we find is fragmented, then it doesn't make sense to consider them as one network. We might as well just study the fragment part by itself. So just because we want to study how the members interact with each other, uh, it naturally makes sense that we only focus on the connected subgraph that were um, that uh, as a uh, as a state space. Do we have any questions? Okay. So even if we zoom in from uh, k out of n to only the connected subgraphs of G, this problem is still proven to be complete. So that's why this poses a great challenge to us because computationally it's a very, very difficult problem. And we need um, some sort of algorithm to ha that have good performance and have good property to, to tackle this. So what are some existing approaches to deal with this? So there are quite a few techniques to find uh, the maximizer for the previous optimization problem. Uh, it can be loosely divided into two categories. The first category is pruning technique. So if you imagine network is like a tree and they're cutting off the branches that are less interesting and zoom in on the interesting areas. So the output of this pruning techniques will be the dense regions uh, within this tree. But the problem or some of the uh, underlying challenges for print printing techniques that the computation time is usually a concern. And also, the performance of the algorithms largely depends on the structure of the network. One type of printing technique might, might work really well for one type of graph. But if you have different type of graph as an input, the technique may fail or may not work that well. Another class of techniques is the stochastic search algorithm. So here involves the uh, more classic hill climbing algorithm, MCMC, or some of the more um, modified local search algorithm that's tailored to this problem. So for the stochastic search algorithms, one of the challenge is a computation time. And another one is, since a lot of the algorithms are very ad hoc, so the property of the algorithm are uncertain. We, on, we can only give them a network and give us an output, and we can just take it for what it is. But we don't really know, uh, theoretically, how well should we expect the algorithm to perform. So before I get into the details of an algorithm, um, I would just uh, like to give a, a, a quick highlight of what do we do in this work. So to tackle this problem, uh, we use a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm that incorporates the idea of simulated annealing. And in the proposal distribution for the Markov chain, we incorporate two types of moves. One is local move, one is global move that aims at increased efficiency of the Markov chain. So it can move within the state space more freely. Um, so how many people here know what is Markov chain Monte Carlo? A lot of students who don't because they, they will be seeing it next semester in today's class. Okay, uh, I, propose, I only pr prepare one slide for MCMC. So uh, just Markov Chamber Monte Carlo is kind of awkward. So I just call it MCMC um, from this point forward. So one of the um, so there are uh, quite a few methods in MCMC. One one of the most popular one is called Metropolis Hastings. So um, this is one of the applications of MCMC. So imagine we want to sample from a target distribution. This target distribution could be a posterior distribution from a Bayesian analysis or just something that you're interested in. But sampling from a particular distribution is a very hard problem. And a lot of times, it's not feasible to directly sample from this, uh, from this distribution we want to sample. And a lot of times, you want to make inference about a certain distribution. And based on, like, based on a calculation, it may not be feasible. And what you can do is that you can have a lot of samples from this di distribution you're interested in, and you make inference on these samples. So the goal here is to sample from a target distribution. And since that is a very difficult problem, um, what MCMC does is that, so uh, imagine you have, oh, sorry, you have a distribution that you want to sample from P. And at current timestamp, you're at a state xt. Okay? And then, based on this current step xt you're at, um, you have a proposal distribution of your choice, and you propose a new state. If the proposed state x star have probability that is higher than xt, then we accept the new state with probability 1. Oh, sorry. 
sorry. But if the proposed state have a smaller probability than the current state, we don't reject it, but we accept it with a smaller probability. And how do we calculate the probability is based on, based on this ratio um, that consists of the target distribution and also the proposal distribution. So if you just keep sampling this way, if uh, at each current state, you propose a new state. You either reject it or accept it. And after n steps, the samples you get are as if they were sampled from Px itself. This is given the proposal distribution have the property of being irreducible and periodic. Okay? Um, this is the reason why we have this nice property is based on the stationary distribution of Markov chain. But I'm not going to get into the details of that. So this is the whole idea behind MCMC, is that we want to sample from a target distribution, which is really hard to do. And then we design a Markov chain that have nice property. And in the end, the samples we get are as if they were from PX itself. But, uh, but we, what we actually did is that we always sample from a proposal distribution that we design ourselves. So this is still a little different from our goal, because our goal is to find the maximizer of uh, optimization function. We want to find what is the subgraph that maximizes the density function, right? So this is where the simulated annealing idea come into play. So in a simulated annealing um, algorithm, it's more like a modified metropolis hasting. Um, in this case, our goal is to maximize an energy function or opt, uh, uh, or objective function. And we have a very similar flavor uh, as metropolis hasting. At each step, step x, a uh, step i, you have a current, step, a current state, xi. And you also have a proposal distribution based on your choice. And you propose a new state. And we either accept this new state or we reject the new state. And this is how we calculate the acceptance probability. As you can see, this is still using metropolis hasting rule. If the new proposed state have a higher energy, then we'll accept it with probability 1. But it has a lower energy or lower objective function value, then we'll accept it with this probability that is smaller than 1. The reason why we call it a simulated annealing is because we have a temperature parameter here. And the temperature parameter keep decreasing um, from a very large value until it gets closer to 0. So the reason um, why do we want to have this temperature parameter um, in the acceptance problem calculation is that imagine as if you have Imagine you have a, um, can everyone see the board? OK. So imagine you have objective function that kind of looks like, um, like this. So this is a, like a local mode. But this is a global mode that you are trying to um, identify. And if you just run a, a mark, uh, MCMC, you just let, let your uh, state space wander around on this, it's very likely you're going to get trapped in this local mode. Because whichever state you propose in this neighborhood is going to have a smaller object function than this point here. So it's very likely that your sampler is going to get trapped in this local mode. But what does um, simulated annealing does is that by incorporating this temperature parameter, it was as if you flatten out your objective function first. So at first, when temperature is really high, your object function almost looks like this. It's very, very flat. So your sampler can move very freely um, on, this, uh, on this state space. Okay? So it's less likely to get trapped in this local mode. So this is when temperature is high. Oh, it's high. But as temperature goes down to 0, um, your objective function keeps getting spike here and spike here. And eventually, what you're getting is something like this, or even more spike here than that. So in this case, uh, at first, your sample moves very freely among the state space. And as the temperature keeps decreasing, keep getting spike here and spike here, and it trap your sampler in the good region. And then eventually, it identify the global maximum. So the idea, why do we want to incorporate um, the temperature parameter is because we want to find a good region first. And then we let the 
uh, sampler explore the neighborhood of current state and identify what is the global maximum. So in, um, in practice, it's not two dimensional. So the object function's dimension could be very large and the surface could be very complex. So incorporate this uh, simulated annealing idea in practice usually helps a lot in terms of doing optimization. So this is what um, this is. I feel this. We feel this idea is perfect for what we want to do because usually um, the objective function we're interested in is the the density of a subgraph. And if you look at that function, it's actually very complex. And a lot of the neighboring states have very similar uh, density function. So. It's very easy for our Markov chain to get trapped in the local mode and won't be able to hop out. So incorporating this it enables us to explore all the regions first. And after we find a good one, we stay there and see where is the optimizer. So the next step is that in order for the simulated annealing algorithm to have very, very good performance, it largely the performance largely depends on what proposal distribution you are using here. So the desired dis property of the proposal distribution, uh, di distribution besides the uh, irreducibility and the periodic property, we also want first, since the original um, state space is very large, it's k, uh, it's k out of n, and we only consider the connected subgraphs. So we want our proposal distribution to only propose a connected subgraph instead of just proposing a random subgraph because that is a waste of time because we're not interested in those and it's going to end up getting thrown away anyways. So to increase efficiency, first we want to only look at connected subgraphs. The second property is that when we're at a good region, we want the sampler to be able to explore the neighborhood of the current state. We don't want it to be v jump around like randomly and not have a focus. But the third property that we wanted to have is that we want the sampler to be able to hop out of a local mode if it is indeed trapped in one. So to, to have all these three properties, um, and we have the balance the ratio we spend on explore the current neighborhood or like help out local modes, um, we proposed a proposal, dis proposal distribution that have two types of moves. We first have what we call a local move, and we also have a global move. So I feel I'm going to use this again. Um, if you just look at a, the 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 the, um, the symbols here it might be harder to understand, but if I just look if I just draw you a graph here, it'd be easier. So imagine you are looking at k equals to four. So at current state, you are at this subgraph c k. So what do we propose as a new state? What do we do is first we select a neighbor of c k, which means we select a node that is connected to c k. So now we have a subgraph of size five. Then we consider deleting a node from this subgraph that will not fragment this subgraph. So for example, if I delete this node, this four will still be a connected subgraph. So we just delete a graph, uh, delete a node that will not fragment the, five, uh, the size five subgraph and consider that as the proposed state. So in that case, we guarantee the connectedness. And to calculate the candidate set, we also have a more efficient algorithm that saves a lot of time. So as you can see, the new proposed subgraph and the original subgraph only differs by a pair of nodes. So it is as if you are exploring the neighborhood of the current state, because it only differs very little uh, from where you were originally at. So the local mode is um, aimed at exploring the neighborhood of the current state. And the global move um, is aimed at helping out of a local mode if it has a chance. Um, what do we do in a global mode is that we randomly select a node in the network, and then we grow a connected size k subgraph from this selected node. So we just grow it node by node. Um, do I have questions? No? OK. So we have two different types of moves. One move enables us to explore the current state, um, the neighborhood of current state. And the global move help us help out of the local modes. And this is like a snapshot of our algorithm. Um, at each step t, 
with probability alpha, we propose a local move. And with probability 1 minus alpha, we propose, uh, we propose a global move. And based on this proposed state, we calculate acceptance probability based on the metropolis hasting rule with the temperature parameter in the probability calculation. And we stop after the algorithm reach a certain number of steps or it converges. So how is the global move different than what the annealing is trying to do? The annealing is also trying to help you avoid getting trapped. Yes, um, the global move helps that even more because based on some annealing, sometimes it's not enough. It depends on how the temperature slows down, but sometimes it's hard to control. If the temperature slows down too fast, then it get, still gets trapped in a local mode. And based on um, our empirical experiments, it gets trapped a lot still. So that's why we were thinking maybe we should have global moves. So now that we have an algorithm, before we try it on any real data or simulations, um, we want to see what is the theoretical properties of the algorithm. So we've shown that if the temperature slow down, or cool down slow enough, then the probability of the algorithm finding the true maximum is of probability 1. So this is the uh, definition for the optimum size. And this is, what's, this is saying this is a set containing all the global maximums. And the probability of a sampler um, it being in that set is probability 1. So what do I mean by having the, prob the, by having the temperature cool down slowly? If you look at this constraint, um, we have we we want the uh, we want the summation of this term being infinity. So is this pro is this constraint hard to satisfy or is it easy to satisfy? It's actually not very hard because if you have um, a logarithmic cooling schedule, for example, log t i equals to oh, t i equals to log. Um, log i plus 1, yes, um, oh, then, then all this term will be the summation of um, something, like, something like this, oh, something like this. Then this will go to infinity. So if you have the temperature slow down um, as slow as or even slower than a loss rhythmic a cooling schedule, then this condition will be satisfied, and the algorithm will con converge to optimal site with probability one. Okay, do we have questions? Okay, so that is one of the problems that we're interested in. But a lot of times in practice, we don't really know what is a subgraph, what is the size of the subgraph we're interested in. We don't know if we're looking at subgraph of size eight or subgraph of size fifteen. We only know like maybe some something between size ten or size hundred. So in this case, we're looking for density subgraphs with size bounds. We only have a bound on the size we're interested in, but we don't know exactly what it is. So in that case, the problem becomes mu much more complex because the spa state space just get very inflated, get huge. And this is a very well studied problem in computer science. And in order to tackle this problem, we have to modify our um, first modify our mathematical formulation of the maximization problem, and then we have to modify our algorithm. So before uh, we get into the algorithm, we have to first consider if we can still use the same ob object objective function. So the objective function we have been using is edge density. It's the how many edges you have divided by how many edges it could have been if it were a clique. But it's very easy to show this lemma. Um, what this lemma says is that if you are currently at a graph G, you can always find a subgraph of this G that have a higher density than the original graph. So this is saying if the current subgraph you are having, uh, if the current state you're at is of size 8, you can always go down one size and have a higher edge, uh, edge density than the current state you're at. So if you have this as your objective function, you're favoring smaller graph just by putting this as objective function itself. So um, based on this reason, we're not using the edge density as objective function anymore. We're using something that doesn't differ or that doesn't favor smaller graph or larger graph. 
So what uh, people in computer science does is that it consider the average degree as a new object function. So average degree is defined as the total number of edges divided by the total number of nodes. So it's, um, it's very obvious why this is named average degree, right? So now we have a new object function. Instead of Q, we use R. And we have to modify um, our optimization problem. So here, we're trying to maximize average degree. And the state space is all the connected sets k graph, with c being anywhere in between the minimum k you specify and the maximum k you specify. So this is the new optimization problem they are interested in. So um, in order to deal with this, this problem, we not only need our sampler to be able to explore the current state and jump out of local mode, we will also want sampler to be able to change sizes. Um, instead of just staying at size k, we want to be able to move up and down in different size ranges. So what we did is that for our proposal distribution, um, it has a more complex structure. At each step t, with certain probability, you delete a node from the current subgraph, but you still guarantee the connectedness. And with a certain probability beta 2, you add a node to a current graph, but you still guarantee the connectedness. And with probability 1 minus beta 1 and beta 2, you stay at a current size, but with probability alpha, you do a local move, and with probability 1 minus alpha, you do a global move. So there are four things you can do at a proposal distribution. Um, with certain probability, you go up a size. With certain probability, you go down a size. And when you stay on the same size, you either do a local move or a global move. And um, so this is just a snapshot of what we do in the algorithm. Um, there are some technicality here, like how do we guarantee the connectedness? How do we make sure you stay within the size bounds? But in general, the flavor is you either go up or go down or stay the same size. And we also show that for this um, simulated annealing algorithm with the proposal distribution, if the temperatures cool down slowly enough, the sampler still converge to the optimal set with probability one. So this is um, so the th the theory is always a guidance of what's going to happen I in practice. So this is saying our algorithm should be expected to have good performance. Yes. So can you go back a slide? Uh, oh, okay. So those probabilities that the, for the four different things that uh -huh. happen, does it depend on where you are at a given time or not? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, in the work that we have, we, we don't change the probability. So it's, it's preset as an input for the algorithm. But if you want the algorithm to be more efficient, you can dynamically change um, the parameters during the algorithm, and that is adaptive MSIM. So you can change some of the parameters, I think. Um, so yes, uh, the second algorithm is also shown uh, for the sampler to converge to the optimal set with probability one if we have certain constraints on the temperature. So now we have two algorithms. One is finding the density subgraphs with a fixed size k. Another is finding density subgraphs with sizes that's given uh, within a given range. So how do the two algorithms perform? Before we jump right into um, real world data, we always want to test the algorithm's performance um, on something you know the truth about. So if, if the algorithm can identify the truth, then it works. But if it doesn't, then, you, then it doesn't make sense for you to try it on a real world data set. So what we did first is we tried that on a very classic, uh, classical planted clique problem. So what do I mean by planted clique? So first, you generate a random Erdos Rennie graph. Erdos Rennie graph is one of the simplest models for random graph. In the Erdos Rennie graph, if you still use um, the friendship network as an example. So you imagine you have 100 people. And the probability of any pair of individual being friends is probability p. So in this case, we have 100 nodes. And the probability of having an edge between any pair of nodes is 0 0.05. As you can see, the p is very small. So this graph is supposed to be pretty sparse. So after we generate this Erdos-Rennie graph, we plant a size 10 clique 
within the generated graph. So in this, I'm not sure if you can see, but, but in this Erdos rendering graph, the planted clique is marked in the black dots. So this is the planted clique within a randomly generated Erdos rendering graph. So even if the graph is pretty sparse and is very small, it's still very hard to visually identify where is the clique. And this also um, justifies why do we want to have an algorithm to do this. So for this problem, um, we have our temperature starts at 1 and in 0 0.001, because that's low enough for the algorithm to converge. And we set the alpha to 0.9. So at each step, the probability of staying um, in the neighborhood is 0.9. And the probability of looking somewhere else is 0.1. The reason why I want to do that is because we want to focus on the neighborhood of the, the current region. And because we also have simulated annealing helping us uh, getting out of local mode. So we need less strength borrowed from the global moves. And we did the experiment 100 times, and we identified the clique 100% um, of the time, so which is saying the algorithm does indeed work. This is just a trace plot of one of the 100 runs. As you can see, as the, um, the steps keep increasing, and at the same time the temperature keep decreasing, um, the object function at first oscillates a bit, and then it finally gets to the maximum, which is the clique have a edge density of 1. And it's very interesting because here, apparently, I mean, obviously, it's get tracked in the local mode because it's not getting out of there um, for quite a few hundreds of moves. But as the temperature keeps decreasing, it finally helps out of this local mode and it gets to the global maximum. So how does somebody think about something like signal to noise in this simulation? Um, so because it's, it's not it's these graphical model kinds of things. How, how do you? How, does, how would you increase the amount of noise in this simulation? In this simulation? Yeah. I, in this case, I would say to increase the P. So in this case, the graph is denser. And finding a denser graph with a denser graph is a harder problem. Because then all, this, all, uh, the, all the current states, all the neighborhood states will have very similar objective function. And it's going to be harder for your Markov chain to find what is the local mode, what is global mode, and to move around. And now, um, let's go back to the data set that motivates this whole project, the protein-protein interaction network. So it has um, 4,000 nodes and 6,500 edges. And this is the same plot as I used at the beginning of the talk. So this network was analyzed in a work by Spring and Murney in a PNS paper in 2003. And they identified more than 50 densely connected subgraphs with sizes anywhere between 4 to 35. And the largest subgraph they identify within this network has size 35 and has Q 0 0.119. And they were saying in, in their works that this could be a new subgraph or a new module that has not been studied in experiment. And it'll be interesting to see what is the membership of the subgraph and what does this protein do together? So we are also interested in this problem. And we actually asked the author for the data. And they were very kind. They gave us the data. Because if we, we get the data now, it will be updated. And we weren't able to compare our algorithm with theirs. So the, because, it, because, um, oh, because this East data set keeps getting more complex and more accurate. So what we want to do is we want to compare our algorithm with theirs. So we have to use oh, this data set from 2003 so that we have a fair comparison of what they did and what we did. So using the same data set, we applied our algorithm 1 to search for the densest subgraph of size 35. Um, after 125,000 steps, we find that the densest subgraph of the same size 35 has Q equal to 0 0.2992. As you can see, there's a big difference from the densest one they find and the densest one we find using our algorithm 1. And after we find a dense <coughs> subgraph, the next step we want to see is that is this subgraph significant? Does it carry a signal? Is it, is it, um, so the, is it like based on chance variation that we see something this big? Or is this um, 
something that happens with very small probability and is statistically significant. So the next step we did is we did a, st a statistics test. So um, what we did is that if you randomly generate networks and you see what is the large, what is the densest subgraph of size 35 in this randomly generated networks. And you see for all those for all those size 35 density subgraphs in this randomly generated networks, what are their Q? Is their Q somewhere similar to this? Or is their Q much smaller than this? Or is their Q much larger than this? Is? Based on those random samples, you will be able to calculate an empirical P value for what you identify here. So this is what we did in the next step. We generate 10,000 random graphs that have the similar that have the same degree sequence as the observed network. And for each one of this randomly generated network, we apply our algorithm one and we find what is the densest subgraph of size 35. And we have a histogram of all the Q values for all the 10,000 size 35 subgraphs. As you can see, based on this histogram, the, ident oh, the identified value of 0 0.2992 is way in the red tail. So this, sa this says, based on such a large sample size, our um, estimation for the p-value is still 0. And it's saying, oh, it's saying our the identified graph is highly statistically significant. How much overlap is there in the 35 Um, it's, it's very different. So th they, they, they don't have any overlap. So based on this, you can also see the one that they did define is also statistically significant, but it's not nearly as dense as the one we find. So if the biologist and PhD is going to spend a lot of time and resources to study what does this group of protein do, it might be more promising to study the one that's densely, densely, more densely connected than the original one. So even the one that they found is going to have a p-value of about zero, right? Yes, yes, yes. So there are a lot of like dense ones, but usually um, out of all the dense ones, a lot of them doesn't really give you anything. And so the, this whole algorithm or this whole project is like um, a preliminary step for biologists. They gave us a data set, and we find what are some potential candidates for them to study. And then they spend a lot of time and resources to study what do the, those group of DNAs do, what do this group of proteins do. So if we want to have an output, we want to be as dense as possible, because the denser it is, the more interaction they have within the group, and the more likely it's to be more interesting to study. Does it make sense? OK. Um, so this is for the protein-protein interaction network in the East. And the next study we did is based on a stock market graph. So if you, if you consider all the stocks in the market, it's very natural to think of them um, as a network. So each node represents a stock. And if two stocks have very high correlation for their price, for, price fluctuation over time, then we consider them having an edge between those two. So we did, um, we, is, we collect return prices um, for the American stock market, consists of NASDAQ, MX, and BYSE, um, from October 2008 and October 2010. And based on the uh, price the correlation of price fluctuation of all pair of stocks, um, we Establish a network, and we set the correlation threshold to be 0.5. So if two price, uh, two two stocks have correlation higher than 0.5, then we have an edge. If it's slower than 0.5, we don't have an edge between those two. And the reason why I said 0.2 is because this is one of the commonly used threshold in the literature, and this is considered to be very very high for stocks because for stock prices there are a lot of randomness. Um, and if they have a, a correlation even bigger than 0.2, it's considered to be quite interesting and significant. And the resulting graph have 5,700 uh, 5, nodes and 50,000 edges. And what we did for this is we are trying to find um, a dense subgraph that have sizes anywhere between 100 and 350. 
So um, we still have our uh, temperature setting similar to what we did in the previous example. And alpha is still 0.9, which means at each step, if you decide to stay in the current size, the probability of proposing a local mode, a local move is 0.9. The probability of proposing a global move is 0.1. And beta 1 and beta 2 is set to 0 0.25. What this implies is that at each step, you have probability a quarter going up by a size, you have probability a quarter going down by a size, and you have probability 0.5 staying within the same size, either through a local move or a global move. And this is a trace plot um, of what happens when we run the algorithm. First, this is the average degree. As you can see, at first, it goes up and down a lot, and eventually it converges. And then this is the pl plot for the sizes. And you can see the size have more fluctuation, but eventually it converges um, at the end of the, uh, the algorithm. Okay. And this densest region that we identify have 338 nodes. And if we look at the membership of all the stocks that is in this region, it has stocks from all over the place. It has from material sector, financial sector, healthcare sector, technology sector, all kinds of sectors. Uh, pretty much covers all the sectors for the stocks. So this is also evidence for a globalization hypothesis that was proposed uh, in Boginsky's work in 2006. So in, there, in his work, he's saying now with globalization, everything is correlated with each other. Uh, in, in the old days, the stocks only interact with what is within its own sector. But now everything is interact with everyone else. And as you can see, if we find a dense region, it has stocks from all the sectors. So this is saying all the sectors affect each other. And they work together. Um, they work together in the stock market. And the stock market is not like segmented into different sectors like in the old days. So uh, this is another real world example that it, we did. Um, to summarize, in this work, we proposed two Monte Carlo algorithms to identify dense subgraphs, either with a fixed size or with sizes in a given range. Um, the algorithm combined idea of simulated annealing and efficient moves, more specifically global moves, local moves. And both algorithms are shown theoretically to converge to optimal sites. And we apply that to an East Protein Direction Network, compared with the uh, work with Spring and Ernie, uh, Murney, we identify something that's also very interesting, that are uh, that more densely connected. And we also demonstrate the effectiveness of the method on a stock market data and show some evidence for the globalization hypothesis. Um, some of the other works that I've done and currently interested in um, in the introduction, uh, I mentioned that I also did a work on um, sampling networks for con conditional inference. I also did some uh, graphical models for networks uh, that are resilient to all kinds of attacks. And I also um, did a work on community detection on networks and establish a statistical framework for it and see what are the consistencies for all the clustering methods on networks. Um, some of the ongoing projects I have, one is network clustering or community detection on heterogeneous networks um, based in computation, which is the area that I'm also very interested in. It has a lot of overlap with MCMC and Monte Carlo methodology. Um, also, a very interesting project that I'm currently interested in is causal inference on social networks. So how do you infer the causal relationships on social networks? Um, OK, so that's, um, it's just like a general introduction on what I've done and what I'm currently interested in. And I'll be very happy to collaborate with any of the students or faculties here at the Bellstat Division. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs>